now to the scripture reading this morning. It's found in Galatians chapter 5, 25 to chapter 6, verse 6. Please stand and follow along as I read these verses. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Thank you. Please be seated. And may God bless his own words. Let's open our ears now to Pastor Charles preaching, Bear One Another's Burdens. Well, uh, good morning. We have a few minutes of morning left today. Um, happy Spring Forward Day. I hope that uh, all of you at home were able to uh, get up on time despite the loss of an hour. And before I begin, I just want to highlight the fact that it has been exactly uh, one year since our first virtual uh, service, which was actually on March 15th of last year, and today's March 14th. So we have been at this for a whole year, um, and we, we do have a slight setback today with our, with our one-week uh, quarantine, but nevertheless, I do want to recognize and acknowledge uh, that th despite the many setbacks, despite um, the difficulty that we have experienced, and, and as we have seen in, in our nation and abroad, um, let us remember how our God has been faithful. Let us remember how um, he has been with us, preserved us, and that he has not abandoned us, that God is ruling over the nations. He is ruling over all creation. He sustains everything by the word of his power. And, and week by week, uh, in his faithfulness, he has provided us and given us true spiritual food in his word and in the, in the fellowship of his saints. So let us uh, take a moment to remember that, that God still reigns. Um, I invite you to bow your heads another time uh, as we come before his word. Yes, God, we, we praise you and we thank you that despite the storms, not only of our own lives, but that are quite visibly uh, ravaging, continues to ravage, uh, this entire world with the pandemic and many other catastrophes and disasters and difficulties. Lord, we know that you still reign sovereignly and that your purposes are coming to pass. And Lord, that you are still putting all your enemies under your feet. And so, Lord, we, we take confidence, not in ourselves, but in you. Lord, our 
Rest is not ultimately in the advance of technology, in medical technology, in vaccines, helpful as they are, Lord, but we ultimately look to you. You are our salvation, our shield, and our rock. And Lord, help us to not forget that you were the one who preserves us. You have preserved us, and our path forward is found in the cleft of the rock. So Lord, would you remind us again, Lord, of who you are, and what you have done for us, and your promises for us, your people. Lord, as we come before your word, again, Lord, would you grant your Holy Spirit to us, Lord, that we might receive with soft hearts, and Lord, that you would use me as your servant to preach uh, your message to your people at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Well, there is an idea of Christianity out there that thinks that church membership is an optional, an optional thing. And by church membership, I mean a formal relationship between a church, a local church, and a church member. That's what I mean by church membership. Uh, church membership is belonging to a specific church to a specific group of believers. It's being part of the family, the family of God. Not, and and when, of course, we can understand that generally I'm, I'm overall, I'm part of the overall family of God, but, I, but by church membership we mean a particular group, a particular family of God. Church membership is being committed to a particular church rather than constantly visiting churches, but not actually settling down with one. Uh, like a person who's undecided on what to watch on TV. Uh, so they keep surfing through the channels. When I was young, we had one of these old TVs that didn't have a remote control. They, there were just uh, 13 buttons on them. And so, um, unless you're a willingness to watch TV with your hand on the TV, like two, one foot away, uh, you had to choose a channel and sit, and sit back and watch it, unless you'd be constantly walking back and forth. But now with our remote control, you know, uh, channel surfing is definitely a thing that we do. Uh, you just keep surfing through the channels looking for what you want. And this is an apt illustration of, of, what, of this idea of, of not seeing church membership as required. You can just kind of go flip through the channels. And we see this even on TV. Church services these days, and for many years now, have been on television. But in the history of Christianity, how long have church services been on television? Only as long as the television has existed, right? And I looked this up, television has only existed for less than 100 years. That means church on TV, or whatever, church services, or TBN, or whatever you see on TV, that has only existed for less than 100 years. So for the 1900 years before that, that was not a thing. But when, it, but, but when television became a thing on, I mean, excuse me, when church on television became a thing, now it, it became plausible to do church without actually joining a church, right? You just turn on your TV. You could do church by turning on your TV from the comfort of your own living room and without having to actually interact with actual people who constitute the church. But is church member membership actually optional? In other words, does the Bible have any concept of Christians who are not members of a church? Now, it is true that there are no Bible verses that directly command church membership, right? There's no Bible verse that explicitly says you must join a church when you become a believer. You must join a local body. Rather, it's simply assumed throughout the Bible. It's implicitly taught. Because otherwise, huge chunks of the Bible do not make sense if church membership, if a formal connection to church is merely optional. 
But in reality, the New Testament has no concept of the free agent Christian. If you are connected to Jesus by faith, then you must also, by definition, also be connected to the body of Christ, his church. Now, I'm emphasizing this point at the outset because it is directly relevant to the main point of today's mass passage. My sermon title, taken from chapter 6, verse 2, is Bear One Another's Burdens. Now, who is the one another that Paul is referring to? Does it mean the important people in your life? Bear the burdens of the important people in your life, right? People in your inner circle, maybe in your family, uh, your closest friends. Is, this what, is that what this verse means? Or perhaps more, it, one another refers to, it's a more expansive uh, definition, and it refers to anyone who comes across your path. Whoever you come into contact with, bear one another's burdens. Who is the one another? In this verse that's a very important question because it turns out that there are at least 59 commands in the New Testament about how we are to treat and relate to one another there are at least 59 commandments that tell us how to treat one another that using that phrase well these commands including the ones from our text today they're all given in the second person plural, which, which means you, you all, right? In English, you can be singular or plural, right? So sometimes we say y'all, you all, you guys, right? But in other languages, you can, it's easy to distinguish between singular and plural, right? But all these commands, which are given to uh, which are said in, in, a, in this structure of, for example, bear one another's burdens. They're all given in the you all uh, grammatical structure. You all bear one another's burdens. Right? Keep in mind that these New Testament letters were written for the most part to churches and to the saints, not to individuals. They were written to groups of Christians. And so these commands are not primarily about individual or private Christian life. So these one another commands are primarily about corporate Christian community. For example, the first, the first fruit of the Spirit is love. And so we are called to produce the fruit of, the, the fruit of love generally. But we are also commanded to Love one another, that phrase. Love one another particularly. And so, for example, if I tell my children, love one another, what am I, telling, what am I saying to them? I'm saying love each other. All right? I have three going on, four children. And when I say love one another, I'm saying look around at your siblings and love them. And so that's what's going on in the New Testament. The command to love one another, bear one another, forgive one another is referring to each other. And you cannot obey this command or any other one another commands unless you are part of a church, unless you are part of the family of God, formally. And that is one reason that church membership, being formally, covenantally joined to the church is not optional for Christians. It's... It's part of the fabric of the New Testament. If Christ calls you to himself, then he also calls you to his body, which is the church. The church, you see, is the primary venue in which Christians are called to live out the Christian life. Or to put it another way, you cannot live the Christian life without the Christian community. Right? It is with respect to brothers and sisters in Christ that Paul gives the primary command in this text, which is found in chapter 6, verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Think about a 
a natural family, a natural meaning like a biological family. Think about a family that's properly functioning. Now all of us, we have some degree of dysfunction in our families. Let's recognize that. But imagine, quote unquote, an ideal family. And in, in, an, in an ideal family, what do family members do for each other? They bear one another's burdens, right? It's, and it's not just the parent's job to provide for the children, though they do that. Even little children, uh, to the best of their ability, I mean, granted, little children have less ability than older children and then teenagers and then adults, but even little children carry their brothers and sisters and parents' burdens as, as they are able. And as they get older, as they become more capable, they contribute even more. They share in the work that needs to be done. And in the natural order of things, what happens? The parents age, they get older, they're not able to uh, bear the burdens of the rest of the family as well. Guess what? It's now the, it's now the grown children who take more, more of that responsibility. They do more of the heavy lifting. That's what happens in a family. That's what ought to happen in a family. Now, this same dynamic ought to be working in the family of God. So that when a brother or sister in Christ is going through some difficulty, going through some trial, that is the opportunity for you. If you are a believer, if you are joined to the church, an opportunity for you to come alongside them and shoulder some of their load. And this command here in verse 2 is telling us to, t to have a personal stake in one another's lives, right? It's not simply wishing each other well from afar. Like you hear someone's going through some trouble and you say, I hope it goes well with you. You send them a text message, I hope it goes well with you. And that's the end of that. Rather, as you might, with, as you might do with your own family member, you just go help. Right? You just go and help in whatever way you can. You make yourself available. Now, there is a minimum condition that must be met in order for us to be a people who bear one another's burdens. And our modern lives, our isolated lives, our busy, hyper-busy lives resist this minimal condi condition. What am I talking about? To be involved in each, we need to be involved in each other's lives. That's the minimal condition, right? You need to be known, and you need to, you need to know other people in the church community, right? You cannot merely be content to be social media buddies with one another in order for us to, to uh, obey this commandment, to bear one another's burdens. You actually have to live out and have fellowship with one another. Now, it's been a while since we've recited the Apostles' Creed. We've been going through the Westminster Confession of, excuse me, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. But one of the statements from the, the Apostles' Creed is, I believe in the communion of saints. What does that phrase mean? Well, it means at least two things. First, the communion of saints refers to the Mystical bond, that's what communion means. It means, it means this unity, this, this join together. You, you see the word union, communion, right? There's this mystical bond between all believers in all places uh, through the ages due to our union with Christ. Because we're united to Christ, we're united to one another, right? That's what the first definition of the communion of saints refers to. But it also refers to a second thing. This communion must be lived out. It's got to be lived, it's got to be fleshed out in our daily lives. And so one great task of the church is to improve our fellowship with one another so that it becomes more and more like the spiritual reality that that has been established in Christ. Does that make sense? It, it means that, <clears throat> yes, we are united in Christ because, of, because 
We are united together. We have communion together. But now we've got to live it out. We've got to actually live out that fellowship that has been purchased for us in Jesus. The point being, we can't just assume our fellowship. We've actually got to share our lives together. We must pursue knowing our brothers and sisters and being known by them. Because this sort of intimacy is required if we're going to carry one another's burdens. How can I carry your burdens if I don't know what your burdens are? Or how can I, how can you carry my burdens if I hide my burdens and my sins from you? Jesus, in his wisdom, has brought redeemed sinners, that's each of us, he has brought redeemed sinners together in a bond of unity. So, brothers and sisters, let us, let us pursue spiritual fellowship. Let us pursue uh, truly sharing our lives together. And so, Paul gives us two concrete examples of bearing one another's burdens for us in our passage. And the first is found in verse 1, chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Now, this first example of bearing one another's burdens, it doesn't have to do with material hardship, financial hardship. Rather, it has to do with carrying spiritual burdens. This is the scenario. Anyone caught in tran anyone caught in any transgression. This is a picture of someone who's caught in a trap. This is not a picture of someone who willfully, unrepentantly throws off the lordship of Christ over they just throw it off and even though uh, the church, even though uh, the, the elders come and uh, try to bring this, this, uh, this person back to, back to, to Christ, uh, they just resist and they just decide to go their own way. That's not the picture that we are seeing here. Rather, the, this person here, this person who's caught in any transgression, they've been, they're caught. They've been jumped by sin. Perhaps this person has been negligent in their watchfulness against sin. You've got to be watchful, otherwise sin is always lurking in our hearts. Right? Perhaps this person was caught unaware of their sinful corruption that remains in all of us. Whatever the case, this, their sin has overtaken them. And this is how sin works, right? Even though all of us are culpable, we're res responsible for our sins, sin is deceitful. It tricks us. It traps us. It promises to give us freedom, but it ends up enslaving us. And even after we come to Christ, even after we've been a believer for many years, none of us are impervious. None of us are immune to, to the deceitfulness of sin. All of us are susceptible to be caught in any transgression, as we see here in verse 1. And what we often don't realize is that such people, such people who are caught in sin, they're burdened. Right? Think about the lyric that we sang earlier in this service. The sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. Sin promises joy and life, but it actually leads to death. It leads to enslavement. And so how are we to relate to these brothers and sisters who are suffering casualties in their spiritual warfare? Right? These, we see someone, one of our brothers and sisters in Christ, they are caught in sin. Should we dismiss them as unspiritual sinners who are just going to get what they deserve? Should we look the other way because it's not really our business? Should we shrug our shoulders 
because it's their choice. If this is, one, if this is what they want to do, it's what they want to do. There's nothing I can do about it. Is that what Paul tells us? No. We cannot take the stance that Cain took toward his brother. Remember Cain's famous line, am I my brother's keeper? Right? And we know the answer to that. If you are in Christ, then yes, you are your brother's keeper. Let's read this passage again, or this verse. If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Restore the person caught in any transgression. Bring back the sinner. You know, typically, when Christians are caught in sin, we typically feel a measure of shame, right? And so, what do, what do, the, what do such brothers and sisters do when they're caught in sin? They retreat from the fellowship of the church, right? And, be, and that's in the nature of sin. What does sin cause us to do? It causes us to hide. Remember Adam and Eve? What did they do after they sinned? They hid so that God won't, wouldn't see them, right? And that's the same for all of us. When we're caught in sin, we want to hide. We cannot handle the piercing gaze of God. And in, in addition to that, we don't want other people to see us. But what does restoration do? Restoration must be done in a spirit of gentleness, right? When, when, when someone is uh, shrinking back and hiding, we've got to come in a spirit of gentleness. And so this is not a time for us to bring our harsh criticisms. This is not a time for us to come with our, I told you so. Gentleness, after all, is a fruit of the spirit. And we are to imitate the gentleness of Christ to us if we're going to minister to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Restore the sinner. What does that mean? It means as best as you can, seek the spiritual health and well-being of your brother. Seek the restoration of your sister back to Christ. This means admonish. Reprove, correct, seek their repentance. But you don't do it by sheer force of will. You don't do it with a laundry list of accusations. This is what you did. Restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Now, let's be clear. This is a very difficult thing to do. All of us are naturally inclined to err in one of two ways. Some of us are inclined... Some of, our, some of us are so concerned to not offend, we don't want to say anything upsetting, that you neglect what's the necessary thing to say, right? The words that they need to hear about repentance and returning to Jesus. Turn from your sin and return to Christ. We forget to say that. Others of us are on the other side. We have no qualms about unnecessarily offending that oftentimes our words end up insulting and cruel. There is, there is danger on both sides. This is why Paul assigns this task of restoration to you who are spiritual. Now, who is this spiritual person? Is this referring to the super-Christian? Is this referring to a special class of Christian no. This is referring to someone who is led by the Spirit. Right? We just finished our series on the fruit, of the fruit of the Spirit. And if you took anything away from the series on the fruit of the Spirit, you would understand that the fruit of the Spirit is not reserved for the super-Christian. It is for all of us who are indwelt by the Spirit. And so this phrase, you who are spiritual, refers to anyone who is being led by the Spirit. Anyone who walks by the Spirit. A person who obeys the desires of the Spirit. And if you obey the desires of the Spirit, what are you going to do? You're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit. It will happen. Spiritual Christians are not a special group of super Christian warriors. No. Remember, if you are united to Christ by faith, you have been given the Holy Spirit. 
So this phrase here, you who are spiritual, refers to a person, simply, who keeps in step with the Spirit, who hears the voice of the Holy Spirit in their heart and says yes and obeys the Spirit. So church, let us bear one another's burdens, especially in the area of transgressions. Now there is a second example here in our text of burden bearing, and that's found all the way in the bottom in verse 6. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Now this is an area of burden bearing that has to do with the everyday matters of financial support. Congregations are called to provide for the financial needs of those who teach, uh, the ministers of word and sacrament who serve them. Now, I don't feel the need to dwell on this point too long, because thankfully for myself and for your own sake, you do, congregation, Chinese Gospel Church, you do share all good things with me. And we, and we, we are very grateful. But providing for the needs of the pastor is one instance of this overarching principle that Paul lays out here. Bear one another's burdens. Clearly, it refers more than just bear the pastor's burdens, but it means one another to each of us in this congregation. Because it is a fact of life that in this fallen world, we all have burdens to carry, right? We have financial burdens, emotional burdens, spiritual burdens, the list goes on and on. Let us be a people, a congregation, a church where we shoulder each other's burdens. And why should we do that? Because by doing so, Paul says, you fulfill the law of Christ. Now, if you recall, I know it's been a while, the major theme of this letter to the Galatians is justification, that is, being counted righteous before God, not by works, but through grace alone, through faith alone, right? Not by law obedience. It is not by our obedience to the law of God by which we are justified. So when Paul speaks here of the law of Christ, he is not saying this is a new law that you got to obey in order to be counted righteous before God. This law of Christ is not a way for us to earn favor. It is not a way for us to earn God's blessing. It is not a way for us to, for us to receive God's, uh, God's righteousness. Rather, Christ fulfilled the law perfectly. Right? We, we understand this. He, perfect, he was perfectly righteous in his life and in his death, so that when you are joined to him by faith, he gives you the Holy Spirit. And so when you have the Holy Spirit, you can now do what? What can you do? You can now do what you were unable to do before, which is love your neighbor as yourself. And this was a common theme in our series in the Fruit of the Spirit. What was, if you've been paying attention through our nine sermons through the Fruit of the Spirit, they follow the same exact track every time. Here it is, ready? We can't produce these fruit. But whoa, Christ did it gloriously and perfectly. And by faith in him, we are now enabled and empowered by his Holy Spirit to follow after Jesus. If your life and my life is about any law, may it be about the law of Christ. We need the law of Christ held out in front of us. Because when we take our eyes off of Jesus, do you know what we do instead? If we take our eyes off of Jesus, what do we do instead with regard to our neighbors? This is what Paul warns us against in chapter 5, verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. See, the natural bent of our hearts is to be conceited. Um, 
conceited has this, a certain connotation. I like the word vainglorious. What is vainglorious? Right? Conceited obviously means like prideful, so there's this inward, like you're the center of the, the I'm the center of the universe. So if you're vainglorious, however, there's an extra element. You want the glory, but it's all vain. It's, it's vanity. It's not real glory. It's pretend glory. And so our vain glory in verse 26 is expressed in two different ways. Either in provoking one another or envying one another. If we are actively vainglorious, we provoke one another. That is, we aggressively challenge others. We throw our weight around. I'm, I think of, in, in terms of social media these days, I think of Twitter. Uh, Twitter is, this is a stereotype, but it's generally true, that Twitter is a active grounds of provoking one another. It's people throwing their weight around, aggressively challenging each other. But the other way that our, our conceitedness, our vainglory is expressed is passively. We, so, uh, others of us are not active, actively conceited, we're passively con conceited. And we do that by envy. And what's envy? You want what someone else has. And so you brood in your misery that someone has it so well and you don't have what they have. And I, again, in terms of social media, I'm thinking here of Instagram. Scroll through Instagram, you just see the lives of the rich and famous. You see uh, people are doing so well. I mean, these are really curated pictures, right, typically. Um, again, just a stereotype, but uh, these two social media platforms either cultivate envy or uh, provoking one another. And all these proceed from the same heart, a heart that is conceited, vainglorious. David Pallison, he was the former director of CCF. Uh, he passed away last year. But he has a memorable illustration that describes this dynamic of our conceited hearts. You know, God has created and ordain that people are different, right? You look around, uh, maybe you can't look around now, there's nobody here, but you know, um, in, your, in your minds, imagine, look around and you'll, you'll know that people are different, right? But has it occurred to you that God has ordained these differences? In, order, in other words, he has ordered his creation to ha to, for there to be a, a diversity. And by diversity, I don't just mean like people of, of different colors. That's, how, that's what we usually think in our modern context, right? But th the difference is in every category. For example, some people are small. Some people are great. Some people are poor. Others are rich. And there's everyone in between. Some are strong, some are weak. There are smart people, there's some uh, not so smart people, right? There are differences in beauty, in health, in power, and so on. You can think of any range or any uh, category and there are gonna be differences across the board. Now, what do we do with these differences? What do you do with these differences? And here is Dr. Paulison's insight. Our hearts, and when I say our hearts, I'm talking about us, we. We have a deep tendency to take any given spectrum, this range of differences, and we put it on its end and we make it a ladder. So the top of the ladder has value and the bottom has shame. And so, for example, let's say in your heart you value popularity. Right? So if you value popular, popularity, you put popular people on the top of the ladder. Right? And, but then if you don't have it, you yourself are low on the ladder. And so these things, 
popularity, whatever it is, athleticism, good looks, uh, money, you can think of anything, these things become loaded with good and wrong. If you have a lot of this, you're good. If you have, if you have a little of it, you're, you're, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, or you are ashamed of yourself. These become the places where you define your identity. And this affects everyone. We have a genius for putting up the wrong standards. We put up these ladders of comparison, and we spend our lives trying to climb the ladder. And even if you're at the top of the ladder, however, you got to realize this. Even if you're at, a top, at the top of the ladder, there is nothing of value in these ladders. And that's because these are ladders to nowhere. And this is the phrase that has stuck with me all these years. I first um, learned about it in seminary. These are ladders to nowhere. They don't go anywhere. Even if you fail on this ladder, you are at the very bottom, you feel like a failure. But there is actually no significance to these ladders. They don't add any meaning to our lives. And that's what Paul is warning, warning against in this passage, against being conceited. We're so full of vain glory because these ladders do not lead to glory. They lead to nowhere. So whether you're on the top, looking down on all those losers below you, or you're at the bottom, and you're full of envy at the people who are above you, you're still on a ladder to nowhere. Even after we come to Christ, we're still so very susceptible to this kind of thinking. And so, let's say after you come to Christ, oh, you're not about earthly success anymore. You're not about um, becoming wealthy or, or whatever. And now, instead, you've erected a different ladder, a ladder of righteousness. And so you begin to compare your righteousness with others. Or in my case, as a pastor, I can tell you, I'm, I don't have a ladder of wealth. I don't find my, wor my worth in my net worth, right? Meaning I don't compare myself to others in that area. Otherwise, I mean, I'll be, it's, it's not great. But I am often tempted to find my worth in something called ministry success, right? Which is kind of hard to define, but generally, it's like, how big is your church? And uh, how many... How many people are coming, and is, is it a vibrant ministry? You, you can imagine what that is. I find myself comparing myself with other pastors, envying the size of their ministry, the influence they have, the accolades they receive. Right? None of us are immune to this kind of thinking. We so readily absorb the world's ideas about winning and losing without thinking, what does God really think about these ladders? What do you think? What does God think about these ladders? Well, if you've read through the Bible, you'll know that he lays down these ladders flat. Boom. Before God, every human being is poor, naked, blind, and miserable. Every ladder that we set up before him is meaningless. But there is one ladder, actually, that does go somewhere. Not to nowhere, but this one ladder leads to heaven itself. And this ladder is not about human difference. It's not about, like, if you're better at this or that. It's not about earning. This ladder is not about human difference. The standard on this ladder that leads to heaven is that we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and body. The standard on this ladder to heaven is that we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And this is a much harder standard, one that we cannot fulfill in our sinfulness. <clears throat> and that is why Jesus Christ came down this ladder. Jesus Christ came down this ladder and he loved God perfectly with all his mind, body, soul, and heart. 
Jesus Christ came down this ladder and he loved his neighbor as he loved himself. How did he love his neighbor? He laid down his life for his neighbor. He, lay, he laid down his life for you. Beloved, Jesus gives you this ladder. For when you trust in Jesus, it's not about your accomplishments. It's not about your abilities, your so-called righteousness, or whatever else you find your self-worth in. When you trust in Jesus, it's about what he has accomplished for you by his obedient life, his sacrificial death, his triumphant resurrection. And if you remain on this ladder to heaven, not by your doing, but by believing and trusting and adoring and fixing your eyes on Jesus, then you will be enabled to fulfill the law of Christ. By keeping your eyes on Jesus, you were enabled to obey the law of Christ. And what is the law of Christ? That we would bear one another's burdens. Not in order to earn our salvation, but because Christ bore our burdens for us. You will bear one another's burdens because Christ is in you by the Holy Spirit. And on this ladder, there is no way that you, be, you can become conceited, vain, glorious. When your eyes see the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ, that burns away any notion of your own glory. That, that, that just burns away any idea that you should be conceited. There's nothing for you to be conceited about. On this ladder, your life is no longer about garnering glory to yourself, but it is about bringing glory to the one who loved you and gave himself for you. Let's pray, church. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we praise you. We, we praise you, Lord, for bearing our burdens for us and for um, giving us eternal life. And so you have given us your law, Lord, not in order to earn it, but you have truly earned it for us. And Lord, would you allow us to see your glory, your beauty, which enables us then to follow in your footsteps. Lord, help us to not be conceited, to not provoke one another, and to be envious, Lord, but to bear one another's burdens, just as you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.